the exciting thing for me about nanosats is that you can build them with relatively little effort. It doesn't take tens of millions of dollars to come up with all the hardware, the software, the control systems. We're looking at quadrupling, quintupling the number of satellites in orbit over the next few years. We have figured out how to miniaturize satellites. So satellites that will typically have been the size of a bus, uh, sometimes a double-decker bus. Um, and we have taken that technology and tried to shrink it into tiny packages. Preliminary fuel tank pressurization started. VDM enabled. We don't build the rockets ourselves. We just hitch rides on um, other people's rockets. Odium bus voltages and current nominal. I think we're just beginning to see the implications. Not so much for the space industry, but for what everyone here on Earth is going to do with what's coming back from the space industry. We had 26 satellites on that uh, rocket. I was actually in the process of writing a tweet about how awesome the liftoff has been and been like, you know, go doves go, and then it blows up, and all of a sudden I need to start thinking about communicating about, oh, hey, space is hard, and we'll try again next time, and this really isn't the huge disaster that it looks like. Dad, what happened? It fell down, it blew up, buddy. We didn't put everything into one big satellite that cost a billion dollars. Um, when those things blow up, that's really tragic. But we spread our risk by putting our satellites on lots of different rockets, and it's, it's not the end of the world if one blows up. So this is what we call a dove. It's, a, it's just a little satellite. It weighs about four kilograms. This is not a model of the dove. This is a real thing. I mean, it's the, it's the real size. Inside is a telescope. Um, so the main volume of the satellite is a telescope system. At the back is the camera that looks through that telescope to take images. So the satellite is flying along like this, taking images of the ground as it, as it goes. Just every second or so, it takes a new image that's about 15 by 20 kilometers in size. Um, they also have solar panels all around the outside that actually open out to give us more power. We also have some art. that the, We have an artist in residence who puts art on the side of our satellites. We believe we're one of the first people to put art in, in space. The key thing that we built upon is things like this, which, you know, incredible amount of capability is stuffed into smartphones. The latest uh, sensor systems, cameras, radios, they've got many radio systems, of course, super duper processors, hard drives. When we were at NASA, um, me and my co founders, we were thinking, how could we leverage this cool technology that we're f finding in our pockets for space? The unique m moment was really uh, when uh, we had launched some uh, smartphones into space. Oh. We just started building satellites in our garage in our spare time down in the South Bay here in California, and uh, it, it's a bit of a, uh, a, a thing around here to s just start building it in your garage and build it and they will come.
Пошел спутник. Our satellites uh, get imagery about three to five meters per pixel. So that means you can see a tree, you can just about see a, a vehicle, like a truck or a ship or something like this, but you can't see individual people or you can't read a number plate or something like that. Google Earth, I think they update every six months to a year, but then that's not a full new global map. That'll only be updated in the regions where they have new high resolution data. And what we'll be doing is providing basically a guarantee that your area will be covered as long as it's not cloudy, every single day. Democratizing access to our information about the planet is really important in our mind. Um, it, it, satellite imagery has traditionally been the province of governments and large companies to date. Um, but we're trying to enable the smaller folks, if you like, the NGOs, the researchers in universities, the uh, small companies to get access to the data as well. So you can, if you're trying to track deforestation, for example, if you take satellite images every few years, you wake up at the end of a few years and there's a bloody great hole in the Amazon, right? Uh, if you take images every day, well, you can literally see any tree goes down when it goes down and then stop illegal uh, logging activity. That's just one example. There's many others like tracking and stopping illegal fishing, helping with disaster response after floods or fires or earthquakes, quickly having data that helps responders to go into those places. Even though the imagery that Planet is collecting is not as detailed as what's available from some other imagery satellites, they'll be able to detect these changes and then pass that information along to say, hey, you should look over here. There's something interesting happening. We maybe can't see it as clearly as we would like, but it's definitely worth checking out with a higher powered camera. Well, I think it's very open, collaborative. We see lots of people working together from different parts of the company and throwing in ideas to each other. How do we make sure that product is actually listening to the needs of its users? Because Each individual here is contributing in a way that is pushing the envelope on some technology. Are those spaced correctly at this point, or are they still getting...? Uh, they're almost there. We have people who have done the traditional space background, obviously, um, people from all over NASA. And then we have a lot of people that are coming out of school and they're, they've studied design, they've studied all these really cool other things that we need. My name is Avanti Mankar, and I am a project manager for the ground station team at Planet Labs. Prior to being a planet, I was at the San Francisco SPCA as a veterinary technician, and basically that meant I was a nurse for puppies and kittens, is how I describe it. Yeah, yeah um, it was a pretty big leap, but I think for me, when I was thinking about leaving my job and looking for something new, I definitely knew that I wanted to be somewhere where they had a really strong mission and they wanted to do good. shape is actually pseudo-random. Is it? Yep, uh, so. Our team manages the ground station network, which is basically the dishes that will downlink all of the imagery that we're coming, getting. We have stations all over the world. We have them on several different continents, some in Australia, some in the US, United States, some in the UK. It is definitely getting really busy. Um, I really like to organize things and herd cats as it is. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Exciting. So this is Mission Control. This is where we operate all of our satellites. So traditionally, NASA and Mission Control is very closed off. It's a lot larger, but our team is pretty small because a lot of the things that we do are automated. Actually, we call them doves because traditionally in aerospace, they've always been very aggressive names. But since our satellites, we wanted to do good with the world. We had like a peaceful name for them, so we call them doves. So each satellite is a, a dove. Each launch we call a flock. So we have a flock 3P coming up and that's gonna be launching in about a week. I'm Robert Simmon, and I'm the lead of the data visualization team here at Planet. In 
college, I was taking classes in synthesizers and electronic music and computer music, and essentially ran out of classes that I was available to take. And so I started getting into computer graphics. That led to doing data visualization at NASA. We're essentially building a time machine. So what that means is we're building up an archive. And so if something happens, you can go back and look at that place and see how it's changing over time without just having to rely on taking a snapshot after something interesting happens. So this is near Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, which is on the western coast of the Arabian Peninsula. And then one of the other interesting things that we see fairly frequently is oil tanks. And if you look closely at this, you can see these shadows on the inside lip of the tank, and that's where the lid of the tank is actually floating on the oil. So as the oil level rises and drops, the size of that shadow will actually change. And so if you are looking at this every day, you can build up a map of the amount of oil that's stored in a given tank farm. And so you get a real-time picture of how much oil there is in the world, and that will give you a method to basically predict future prices. Well, it's one of these contested islands in the South China Sea, where you have China, Philippines, Vietnam, all have a claim. Um, and in July of 2016, you can see the reef um, pretty much intact, uh, fairly healthy. You can actually see that there's been a channel cut in the outside of the reef, and that could allow easier access to the interior. So this was, it's uh, what, the 7th, so two days ago, and so, yeah, it looks like we've got a boat there, a boat there, another one here that has just gone right through. Just for context, uh, right now there are somewhere between 1,400 and 1,500 active satellites in orbit for the entire world, for all operators in all countries. I think it just goes to show how this Silicon Valley mentality is being applied to the space industry, and it is a major shift. The larger impact that we're seeing is in these traditional aerospace companies figuring out how to behave a little bit more like the upstarts. There's certainly some concern that the addition of all these satellites is going to cause some traffic control problems. When things collide in space, it's very bad, not just for the two things that collide, but for everything around them, um, because each collision causes debris and each piece of debris then is moving so quickly that it can in turn destroy other satellites. It has the potential to linger for a very long time, uh, possibly past the duration of humanity. <laughs> called the Joint Space Operations Center that 
has radar systems and telescopes that are constantly scanning the sky, just trying to track everything that's up there and how it's moving. Well, it's an incredible opportunity for anybody to work up here. We're approximately 10,000 feet above sea level and we work on a volcano and we get to stare into space. Well, space debris is a growing problem. The Space Surveillance Network tracks about 16,000 objects in orbit. Of these, about 5% are actual functional payloads, about 8% are spent rocket bodies, and 82% are inactive satellites or space debris. The sensitivity of our system can detect objects that are 10,000 times dimmer than the human eye can register, and we can detect an object the size of a basketball more than 32,000 kilometers away. We find new objects every single night. It's also challenging because these nanosatellites can be somewhat difficult to track because of their size. People have discussed using lasers to either burn up pieces of debris or change their orbit in such a way that they do come back to Earth and burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. So every once in a while, uh, the International Space Station has to change its orbit slightly because there's a piece of space debris coming up. That problem is in the 800 to 1200 kilometer altitude band. And there, there's so much stuff from previous satellite missions and rocket bodies and so forth that, there's, that it's starting to collide with each other on a regular basis and cause collisions that then cause more pieces of debris that then causes more collisions. And so it's a runaway spiral. And we have to do something about that. Uh, but we at Planet put our satellites very low, about 400 or 500 kilometers, well below that whole mass if you like, um, and that make sure that they don't contribute to that problem. So we put them in orbits where they degrade and re-enter the Earth's atmosphere on that sort of time frame of about three years. And so they won't, they won't stay up there as junk for a long term. A company like Planet understands that if they create a mess, then it's going to directly affect their own business. Um, so they have every incentive, if they wish to continue making money, um, to do whatever they can to preserve the space environment. <laughs> That's about the only thing I'm not going to answer. We don't go into the details about that in some of our secret source. We'll see if Planet has succeeded or not. And this is one of the questions that the incumbents and other people like to raise about these startups. Are they truly profitable? Are they building a sustainable business? Or are they simply burning up venture capital money, um, trying to pull far enough ahead that they will then eventually develop a sustainable business model? And we have over 100 customers around the world that are taking our data today and paying us for it um, to, for various different reasons. is a complicated place. We like to believe it's part of our responsibility to deliver the next generation of intelligence. It is part of our responsibility to be aware of all of the ways that we can sense the planet. NGA is a combination of both combat support, helping the military deploy, employ, etc., 
but also we're an intelligence agency. We're part of the United States intelligence community, and that's to understand not just what's happening today, but anticipate what will happen tomorrow. Planet's advantage, in our view, and the reason why we've contracted with them to begin to explore what we could learn is the fact that they repeat their sensing of the planet in a way that no one else does today, at least not at that magnitude. Um, I have to tell you, for somebody in my profession, that's very exciting. They get basically what the strength of planet is, and that is that frequency, that every single day. So um, presumably, the US military has a, a relatively small number, say five to 10, very high resolution satellites. They can only look in one place at a time. And so that's a, a really big limit on what they can observe. And with Planet Labs, you get this much coarser view, but you're gonna get it everywhere every day. concerns with planet and this ability to image the entire Earth is to do with what people will do with the information. The US-based monitoring service has released satellite images that it says show North Korea is primed and ready for its sixth and perhaps biggest nuclear test. For better or for worse, it will change how people behave. There has long been an understanding that um, certain governments um, hide certain things that they may have out in the open uh, when they know that uh, spy satellites are going to be passing overhead. The White House says these satellite images of Syria's most notorious prison, Saidnaya, are evidence atrocities are being carried out inside the walls. So it does make it harder for oppressive regimes to hide what they're doing. Um, so in that sense, I think it's a very good thing. I think about the ethical side all the time. Um, so our strategy is to basically radical transparency and make the access to the data as easy as possible. And so hopefully that will basically prevent the powerful and the wealthy from monopolizing this type of data. What if someone is using that information for criminal purposes or uh, to harm another person? And this is something that I think the industry is going to have to deal with at some point in the relatively near future. The fact that you can go on the internet today, swipe a credit card, or in some cases not, right? Get a free application of satellite imagery anywhere on the world is a wonderful opportunity in the sense of connecting the planet and, and, and commerce and all that. It also is a risk in the sense that that can expose activities that you'd rather not have exposed. So we're only allowed to sell to the people that the US government grants us a license to. So there are some obvious countries that are not allowed to buy the data. If you have ties to a terrorist organization, you'd be on the, the forbidden list. So we actually count on the US government to identify the bad actors, and then we will abide by those rules 100%. It's something we care about a lot. I mean, we, we, we wouldn't want to do it if, if it was doing um, if you like, adverse things to our personal privacy. Both of our democracies value privacy, right? And, it, and especially when they see some government official talking about, you know, persistent collection of the planet and constant imaging and whatnot, you could imagine people taking that to a dark corner and saying, oh my goodness. Well, first I want to either tell or remind you that that I'm prohibited by our laws from using my capabilities uh, against my citizens, uh, against our, our allies, etc. I will say that I'm more careful about what I do outside these days. Um, it, it makes a person think. 
but at the same time, we're facing this on multiple fronts. It's not just from satellites, it's also from drones, whether they're commercially operated or government operated. Well, we're very excited um, about acquiring Terabella. They have slightly bigger satellites. Um, they're about the size of a, a, a fridge, um, a mini fridge. Uh, they weigh about 120 kilograms a satellite. And what that enables um, is, is higher resolution imagery. And you still can't see a person or identify a person uh, with this sort of imagery, but you can see more detailed things about buildings in urban areas. Now, I don't think they're currently releasing that video in real time, but within another five years, and I would say almost certainly within 10, we can expect live video or close to live video of many of the Earth's major metropolitan areas. Everyone, uh, this is a really quite a big day for us here. We're launching 88 satellites on this rocket. If it succeeds, we will be operating the largest constellation of satellites in human history. Um, we will launch on anyone that will, will take, is going roughly the right direction <laughs> and uh, for a good price. And uh, the Indians have, uh, have a great rocket, the PSLV, and so we, we chose them. A perfect lift off, as usual for PSLV, and you can see in all glory, PSLV negotiating the dense atmosphere. Can I curse? <laughs> um, it's fantastic. It's like there was a lot of stress building up to this. You know, we've had a lot of rocky moments, but today it's all good. I think that people here are attached to the doves because so much goes into them, especially for people that have been here a really long time. It's very, very, very emotional and we all are really like a family, I guess. <laughs> about using satellites to advance the human condition. One of the things about being a space geek is that we always approach things from the big perspective. And if you step back and look at the Earth, um, you think about it as the spaceship we have with seven billion astronauts hurtling around the sun, well, we need the data that enables us to take care of that spaceship and so we need to monitor those changes on a fast enough timescale to be able to stop our action where it's being harmful. Yeah. 